Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, to the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions. Perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew, or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud. See conditioned things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. The heart of the perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagawan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain, in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the venerable Sharadvatiputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. 
all the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, Om, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhi, Soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvadi Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Okay, a short mandala offering. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niryataya taking refuge and generating bodhicitta once in Tibetan and twice in English. Sangye chodung sokhi chognam la, jan chu bardu dagni kyag su chi, dagi chun yangi pe sunam gi, drola penchir sangye druparsho. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome everyone here today for our eighth session. And uh, we are making our way through the text. And I'm going to next week um, escalate the, the speed with some of those uh, verses in order to have a little bit more uh, space to spend on the ultimate Bodhicitta section of the text, which uh, is, is very, very profound and, and requires very careful uh, navigation. So I'm not going to be able to do justice to such a profound topic, but I'll certainly happily throw myself in as I, I'll drag you in with me and we'll splash around and see what happens. It's very important to have a, a vigorous, uh, delighted attitude when approaching profound topics because they are incredibly essential. So I wanted to begin today's session by quoting uh, Kabje Zopa Rinpoche. Even in one day, the self-cherishing thought makes your life empty. The reason why every action you do in 24 hours doesn't become the cause to achieve enlightenment is because of the ego. Because the ego is abiding there, there is no place for bodhicitta. There is no place for the altruistic mind to achieve enlightenment, no thought of cherishing others. So in that 24 hours, your activity does not become the cause to achieve enlightenment. Your life is wasted and doesn't become meaningful. That 24 hours of your activity does not become the cause to achieve even liberation from samsara because of the self-cherishing attitude. You experience attachment to samsaric pleasures and perfections, and there is no attitude of renunciation of samsara in your activities during those 24 hours. 
Your attitude is only the desire clinging to samsaric happiness. Due to the self-cherishing thought and attachment, seeking the happiness of this life arises. And even if you manage to meditate or chant mantras in your 24 hours activities, this does not become Dharma. So as I've been um, sort of uh, stressing throughout the sessions, in the place of the self-cherishing thought, um, which whose presence we've been under the sway of since time beginningless, we generate great compassion. And great compassion when it arises spontaneously or naturally, I, it's no longer dependent on sort of fostering it through deliberate um, rational thought processes. It just simply wells up from the heart as our actual attitude of being, if you like. That mind precludes the possibility of the self-cherishing mind to get up and, and away. It directly cuts it off in its tracks. So it's very uh, worthwhile considering that the aspect of great compassion, as we know, is to take away the suffering of other beings, without all beings without exception. And so how could that be compatible with a self-cherishing attitude which has the intent of exploiting others and utilising them for my own gain? They're clearly polar opposites. And that's why great compassion is effectively the antidote. Independence on great compassion, we have the opportunity for the first time of generating the altruistic mind of enlightenment. And independence on that, when that um, mind becomes itself spontaneous, natural, in the same way that great compassion has been able to, we uh, can generate an uncontrived bodhicitta at which point we formally enter uh, the bodhisattva path. So until then, we're trainees. And as I mentioned in the very first discourse, I think it was, there's nothing more precious from a Buddhist perspective than a bodhisattva baby trainee, because it's that tiny little fragile baby who hasn't even yet entered the path, who, if they take the appropriate learning steps, if you like, will uh, enter the path and achieve this very great goal. So I just want to um, quickly cast back to Kabjo Zopa mention of, I'll, I'll requote the passage, due to the self-cherishing attitude, the desire and attachment seeking the happiness of this life arises. And even if you manage to meditate or chant mantras in your 24 hours activities, this does not become Dharma. So this quote clearly indicates the essential role that of our mind, that the quality of our mind that's accompanying the practice, if you like. So I just want to tell here a couple of very famous stories, uh, again, by uh, Kabjai Zopa Rinpoche. In fact, I'm quoting from his new book, which is just being published by Wisdom Publication called The Power of Mantra. So it's a very special publication. And so Kabjai Zopa Rinpoche tells a story of an old woman who, at a time of great famine, used to recite the mantra, um bale bule bunde, so um, in order to cook and eat stones. So she had this capacity when she recited that mantra to transform inert material into nourishing food. One day her son, a novice monk, overheard his mother reciting the mantra and told her that the correct way to pronounce it was om uh, sale sule sunde soha. And when she uh, attempted to transform rocks using that corrected mantra, it didn't work. So she returned to her old method. So that's, that's one story. The other story concerns a man with a very big nose. And this story was told um, by his holiness song Rinpoche. He's one of Kabje Zopa Rinpoche's gurus and many of our teachers' gurus, of course. And this man uh, with a big nose came to a geshe to ask him for teachings. And uh, the teacher at the time was very, very busy and he's a bit brusque. And he said with a wave of his hand to the, to the man, your nose is like a rudra raksha. Rudra raksha. And 
he must have been referring to the fact that the monk had a very big bulbous nose that resembled the uh, Rudraksha beads of a mala. So anyone knows those beads? They're very, very coarse. However, the, the man didn't realise uh, that he'd been told to go away. He took the guru's word or the lama's words to be holy dharma and to be a transmission of a very rare and precious mantra which he proceeded to practice in his own time. So he would repeatedly say, your nose is like a root, root rapture, root rapture, root rapture, as we do with mantras. And through the power of that recitation, he developed the capacity to heal people. That would come, many people would come to him to be healed. And as he was healing them, he would recite this mantra. So further down the track, the Lama who had originally given him the transmission uh, developed his own health problems, particularly he had an abscess on the throat. And his assistant said, oh, look, there's this old man down the road who is, is a famous healer, and he recites a mantra, and you're healed. Would you like him to see you? And the Lama said, yes. So the man came to visit the teacher. And when the, the Lama saw the old man and heard the mantra, he burst out laughing. And as he laughed uproariously, because he realised what the old man had been repeating all those years, his ulcer burst and he was cured. So that's, that's the story. It's a rather delightful story. But it's really showing, both of those stories show very clearly that it's the faith, the state of virtuous mind that's accompanying the mantra that is really, really critical. So... His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, um, it's very good to recite the mantra on Mani Pami Hung, but while you are doing it, you should be thinking of its meaning, for the meaning of the six syllables is great and vast. So His Holiness gives an account in Kindness, Clarity and Insight. Some of us will know that very beautiful book of his collection of essays by His Holiness of, of the mantra. I'll quickly go through it. He says, Om is composed of three letters, a or um, these symbolize the practitioners in pure body, speech, and mind. They also symbolize the pure, exalted body, speech, and mind of a Buddha. Can impure body, speech, and mind be transformed into pure body, speech, and mind, or are they entirely separate? All Buddhas are cases of beings who are like ourselves, and in dependence on the path became enlightened. How is this done? The path is indicated in the next four syllables. Money, meaning jewel, symbolizes the factors of method, the altruistic intention of becoming enlightened, compassion, and love. Just as a jewel is capable of removing poverty, so the altruistic mind of enlightenment is capable of removing the poverty or difficulties of cyclic existence and of solitary peace. Similarly, just as a jewel fulfills the wishes of sentient beings, so the altruistic intention to become enlightened fulfills the wishes of all sentient beings. Padme is composed of two syllables, and together they mean lotus, symbolizing wisdom. Just as a lotus grows from the mud, but is not sullied by the faults of the mud, so wisdom is capable of putting you in a situation of non contradiction, whereas there would be contradiction if you do not have wisdom. There is wisdom realising impermanence, wisdom realising that persons are empty of being self-sufficient or substantially existent, and wisdom that realises the emptiness of duality of subject and object. And the wisdom that realises the emptiness of inherent existence, though there are many types of wisdom, the main of these is the wisdom realising emptiness. That's one being emphasised here. And the last syllable, hum. Purity must be achieved by an indivisible unity of method and wisdom, symbolised by this final syllable, which indicates indivisibility. According to the sutra system, this indivisibility of method and wisdom refers to win wisdom affected by compassion, um, by method, and method affected by wisdom. In other words, they hold each other up. They uphold each other. Enhancement in one enhances the other and vice versa. In turn, uh, 
uh, terms of the seed syllables, the conqueror Buddhas, hum is also the seed syllable, the one at the heart, of Akshobhya, one of the five um, Dhani Buddhas, and re who represents uh, primordial wisdom. Uh, so in other words, the absolute complete attainment of a, of a Buddha's mind. So that's the conclusion. So I just wanted to, uh, solace this presentation there very briefly. So I just want to emphasize that last week when I was making the point that um, it's, there's no mystic power in the syllables, there is actually a mystic power in the syllables. And it is triggered and becomes effective when combined with the appropriate mind. That's the essential point that I'm making. So you can see that in those first stories, even though the old woman's mantra was incorrect technically, she could still use it as a pure mantra effectively because of the incredible power of her faith. And the same with the man reciting uh, the nose mantra. So these are very inspiring examples. And so it really comes back to us as practitioners uh, to think about these topics. So the motivation that's accompanying the recitation of the mantra is absolutely crucial in the same way that it is when we offer even a mouthful of food to a dog. If we offer a mouthful of, a mouthful of food to a dog simply to get the dog to stop barking and to piss off, to go away, that's one motivation and will achieve its effect within its limits. But if we can accompany that same act of giving, which is pure act of generosity from a Dharma perspective, we can be accompanying that with the wish that through this act, this material karmic act, may this creature who happens to be a dog in this lifetime achieve perfect body forms and quickly attain enlightenment in all future lives. And may I give it everything it needs in terms of resources in order to accomplish that. And may this be shared with all sentient beings, this offering. And so that same physical gesture if it was being viewed from the outside by a third party would look identical. But in this case, it has a vast dharmic significance because the, the simple act of giving has been used as a basis for an incredible karmic commitment, a promise. We've entered a covenant, a kind of uh, sacred pact with that animal to protect it. And so it's a great privilege having pets from this perspective. It's a great privilege seeing a bird on a, on a nature strip and, and reciting on Mani Pami Hung. And so we can, Lama Zopi is always recommending that we recite mantras very gently to animals and to our pets because it leaves an, an imprint on their mind. So I thought to make those comments and just to finish them with, with uh, probably the mention of one of the most special mantras and that that is uh, the name mantra of our holy guru and so if we can uh, learn the name mantra of a holy guru and, and recite it in our practice it brings our mind and the guru very very closely together and so this is just a, a piece of personal sharing really um, when I first learned the the mantras of my teachers. I sort of built them into the very uh, foundations of my daily sadhana practice. And so there are opportunities for those, for example, who are doing the Kala Chakra um, sadhana in conjunction with the six session Guru Yoga, uh, which is a practice His Holiness um, often recommends. There's, there's a point there before we do the absorption of the Guru where we recite the Guru's name mantras and imagine. Uh, and receiving the four initiations and so forth. So this is a very, very profound practice. In Mahamudra, um, when we, we finish reciting the lineage prayers, we absorb the guru. And again, this is a perfect point to be reciting the, the guru's holy name mantra. So gurus don't normally talk about their name mantras. They don't broadcast them. And if you're interested, then a sincere student will approach their teacher and, and request it. And, and the guru, if you're, if you're fortunate, of course, will uh, happily confer it. But um, for many of us will not already know um, His Holiness's name mantra, which is often chanted aloud at the beginning of prayer sequences uh, at large public gatherings and also 
Kamjai's Upanishads as well is often given in the uh, structure of the Lama Chopa practice. So that's the introduction. Um, I just want to cover those couple of points uh, because Stephen mentioned they'd come up in, in the discussion. And it also uh, dragged in sideways the topic of humour because those stories of the uh, mantra, <laughs> the man with the big nose and the, the old lady transforming stones are certainly have, have their comic aspects. And the Tibetans have very ribald, uh, rigorous senses of humour. They don't stand on ceremony at all when they want to rib someone. So um, there's a certain delight in these stories. They're very comic. So I'll recite the um, Ton Len verses now and we'll do the meditation of, of giving and taking. So we do visualize the guru on the crown of our head or in the space in front and then perform the visualizations in conjunction with the breath. Lama tu je chen ma gu tru we di dri du nga kun ma lu da ta da la min pa da Thank you. So we'll now uh, return to the main commentary. We, we left off last week at, at verse 52. And um, I'm going to use two translations at, at time, different times. The Venerable Joan Nacelle's translation, which is the uh, official FPMT translation, and at times jump across to the Burzen uh, Sherpa translation, which was in the, is in the Geshe Naundagi book. Wheel of Sharp Weapons, which I've, uh, we've got a PDF available. And it also has that Kishigawa and Dagi's commentary in it, which is very, very precious. So verse 52, um, the, as I mentioned last week, that the verse numbers are now out of sequence by one uh, going forward. So 
verse 52 in the Venerable Jones translation. Summon it, summon it, wrathful Yamantaka. Strike it, strike it. Pierce the heart of the enemy and the self. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin. To the hearts of the enemy, the self, and the executioner, Maraya. So probably the, one of the first questions that's going to come up here is what is the meaning of Maraya? The commentary, the nectar that produces the sprout benefiting others says, quote, whose fault is it that we act like this? Having seen that it is the fault of our self-cherishing attitude, we say, rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin. To the hearts of the enemy, the self, and the executioner, Maraya. Consequently, through viewing self-cherishing to be the root of all faults and cherishing others to be the root of all qualities, we should take this as our heart practice. So Geshe Jumper Gutso says that Maraya means uh, to the refer, it refers to what needs to be killed, what needs to be annihilated. It, it is the summons to kill that has identified its target. And this line, as you can see, uh, if we scroll down through the verse a little bit, if we can, um, probably beyond 54, I think it starts again at 55. We jump down to 55 for a minute. Thank you. Yeah, you can see here, it's now running as a refrain throughout these verses. So we'll now uh, move to verse 53. Hung, Hung, great meditational deity, produce magical emanations. Za, za, bind that enemy under oath. Pay, pay, great lord of death, please do the liberation right. Destroy, destroy, please cut the knot of grasping. So this continues the incantatory tone of imploring the great wrathful protector Yamantaka to come and to intercede in this ghastly state of affairs. And we're also requesting Yamantaka to intercede by assuming multiple magical emanations. You can see in the first line, whatever form works to overcome the foe in whatever circumstance, please manifest exactly in this form and strike the enemy. So we'll now move to the meaning of the, of the Sanskrit syllables. So the, the mantra or magic word Hung, is repeated twice to indicate the two types of bodhicitta, conventional and ultimate. Generally, the meaning, the syllable has no specific meaning, but it can symbolize many things, such as the holy mind, exalted wisdom, and so on, so on. Geshe Jumper Gutso observes that in this context, Hung is like saying, summon it. Geshe Sopa, for his part, refers to the hum as a seed syllable of perfect wisdom. We ask him to rise up and activate his special powers, which are the two types of bodhicitta. So the mighty protector, so we're returning now. the great Lord of death. It's referring to Yamantaka. Za, za, again, refers, that's sort of spelt phonetically there as ja, ja, refers to the two types of bodhicitta again, and it carries the same significance, referring to the destruction of the, the two self-cherishing and self-grasping, but especially the self-cherishing mind. And Jumper, Geshe Jumper Gutso says that the Zar Zar means bring the enemies, tie them up, and do not release them. In other words, it's an instruction, a power instruction to totally immobilize 
the enemy. Here we ask Yamantaka to summon or to bring all these enemies here and to bind them tightly, bind them completely so that they're rendered immobile like someone bound and put in a prison cell or locked in a room. In other words, we ask Yamantaka to bind self-cherishing and self-grasping just as we would render a demon immobile. It is recounted that there was once a demon who, having harmed and killed sentient beings, was rendered immobile and unable to harm others by a Sakyalama who performed a specific ritual for this purpose. And so we're performing our own specific ritual here using these powerful mantric sounds. Pay, pay, explains, uh, can be explained in various ways, but it, it means really crush, crush. And this is said twice for the same reasons as before. So in the last line where it says, uh, please cut the knot of, of grasping, how can this knot be cut? Self-grasping is cut by a realisation of emptiness that things lack true existence, existence from their own side. And self-cherishing is cut by developing a mind that cherishes others and thinks only of what they need and want without thinking of its own needs. In other words, the ultimate mind of enlightenment eliminates self-grasping and the conventional mind of enlightenment eliminates self-cherishing, whereby the knots of self-cherishing and self-grasping that bind our mind are cut. So I just mentioned here in, in passing that in Geshe Sopa's translation, he has a, uh, an addition, additional to uh, us, mantric syllables. I'll just read um, his fourth line. We haven't got a, I, I might have a translation there, do we? Thank you very much. Here we are, yes, 53. So I beseech you to release me from all fetters, shig, shig. I request, uh, beseech you to cut the knot of clinging. So I don't have a specific commentary on, the, on those two syllables and they're not appearing in, in the other uh, translations. Um, so it's interesting. So we'll now move to verse 55. I'm going to quote the Burzen translation now to make things a little bit more difficult here. Appear, Yamantaka, a wrathful protector. I have further entreaties to make of you still. This sack of five poisons, mistakes and illusions drags us down in the quicksand of life's daily toil. Cut it out, cut it off, cut it off, rip it to shreds. So you can see here this violent poetic language is continuing. These are metaphors of aggressive warfare and very precise warfare uh, that's um, you know, like one-to-one -one combat. There's, there's nothing spared in, in this, the brutality of this encounter. So I mentioned at the very beginning of, of these classes, when we think of such a, a wrathful military-like um, sort of power that we're exerting to subdue an enemy, we have to be absolutely particular what our motivation is and make sure that we've uh, identified the correct enemy and we're coming from the right place within ourselves as we exert this force. Otherwise, it can become a very delirious and potentially dangerous, delusional form of aggression, which, of course, is the last thing that we want. So what is the sack of five poisons? This is referring to the five main uh, clasures or delusions, afflicted minds. They are longing, desire, fearful and angered repulsion, close-minded ignorance, arrogant pride, and jealousy. And we often find these five collapsed into the, what we call the three poisonous minds. And when this is the case, pride is collapsed into 
uh, a combination of ignorance and desire, while jealousy is collapsed into a combination of attachment and aggression. So just those forms of it uh, collapsing are very, very interesting. Otherwise, uh, in other words, jealousy is a combination of attachment and aggression. And pride is a combination of ignorance and desire. So we need to recognise these five minds, these five afflicted minds, and very, very precisely generate their antidotes, non-attachment, non-anger, non-ignorance, non-pride, and non-jealousy. And when I say we very precisely generate these antidotes, it means that there's nothing short and nothing left over. We've hit the antidote exactly on the point. And so it's this precision that is really crucial at this level of our practice. We don't waste any energy and we don't create any confusion because we're acting with great clarity and great um, conviction and great insight, in fact, so we don't worry uh, that we're making mistakes. We've already done all the preliminary work to know why we're doing what we're doing. In other words, it's not impulsive behaviour at all. So we'll now move to uh, Burson's translation of 56. We are, down the bottom there, we are drawn to the sufferings of miserable rebirths, yet mindless of pain, we go after its cause. Trample him, trample him, dance on the head, of this treacherous concept of selfish concern, tear out the heart of this self-centred butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. Again, I think this is self-explanatory, but it is confronting to consider that this verse concerns all the activities done over our entire lifetime. So this is getting back to our quote from at the beginning of uh, Kabuze Zopa Rinpoche about our 24 hours, every minute is wasted while it's under the control of the self-cherishing mind. We know that this is true by observing all the activities we do throughout the course of a single day, everywhere, the operations of selfish concern are evident. If we do manage somehow to interrupt the course of this magnetic attraction to the delusions and to selfishness, it is only for a few brief and fragile moments, which are quickly swept away as we compulsively return to our usual selfish operations. So the question comes up, don't we already have enough problems, enough suffering, without adding to them. Hence, we must immediately challenge and conquer this self-centered butcher who slaughters out chance to gain final release. So verse 57, we have high expectations of speedy attainment, yet do not wish to work at the practice involved. We have many fine projects we plan to accomplish, yet none of them are ever done in the end. Trample him, trample him, dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centred butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. So the Venerable Jones translation, which is uh, 56 in her numeration, so she's Um, 56, yeah. So, uh, although, um, I've got down here, our effort to accomplish, what am I doing here? Our effort to accomplish our immediate wishes is small. We do not accumulate any of the many activities uh, we do rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings out, about our ruin to the hearts of the enemy, the self and the executioner, Maria. So I don't quite know what's happened there, but I've got a slightly different uh, variant there. But anyway, it's, it's not, not uh, critical to the topic. 
What we're really referring to in this verse is a gap between what we wish to achieve and the preparedness to extend effort towards it. And it's referring very particularly to our spiritual uh, activities where we expect to have advanced realisations and, and incredible insight and, and meditative accomplishments and so forth without actually putting the hard work in to our, our practice. And even in secular terms, we have many fine plans, uh, elaborate plans to accomplish various things. But even in these cases, we don't even begin to put the sufficient footwork in to bring about uh, an opportunity for the results that we might anticipate to arise. And so we obviously need to fill that gap. So this verse is really indicating a, a weakness on our part. It exposes our lack of great compassion as we're proceeding without any real conception of the magnitude of what we're attempting to spiritually uh, achieve as aspiring and engaging bodhisattvas. In other words, if we really understood why we're practicing, urgently wishing to rescue others without exception from suffering, then there'll be no grounds for procrastination, no grounds for dawdling or half-hearted efforts. And I think we see this very much exemplified in, in, our, in our own precious teachers, like Kabje Zopa Rinpoche, when he's in retreat with, with students, in often big public retreats, the moment three-hour discourses are completed, he is offered a cup of tea by his attendant, and then he gets out all the ingredients to do a, a puja for the insects that are landing on, on the lake uh, of the water, um, the dam that's supplying the water supply for the garden of the monastery. And you spend two hours praying that those insects and all beings, of course, can have a successful rebirth and be guided to enlightenment. There's not a minute wasted in between those two activities for Lama Zopra. It's one fluent, continuous mode of, of intense practice. This is, of course, very, very inspiring. This is the kind of energy that we're, we're needing. But having recognised this, Geshe Doga in his commentary on this verse advises, in spiritual practice, I'm quoting, it is generally better to think of making steady progress along the spiritual path rather than feeling the need to make rapid progress. Then you will know that even if progress doesn't happen that quickly, it doesn't matter. You can motivate yourself to make consistent effort and try to make step-by-step -step progress. We should practice Dharma by trying to integrate our practice into our everyday actions and thoughts and not see our practice as something separate. Through making a consistent effort, we can make more progress. So we don't attempt to jump ahead in an unrealistic fashion because this destabilizes the very foundation of our, our resolve to practice purely. We, we get overexcited and we get uh, perhaps a bit reckless and a bit greedy and we grab at opportunities to spiritually practice. We rush off to this initiation and that initiation and that teacher and another teacher and we gird ourselves with all of these names of practice. But if we leave our mind out of it and the need to transform our mind out of it, then we've entirely missed the point of why these practices are even there. So in relation to the line, we have many fine projects we plan to accomplish, yet none of them are ever done in the end. Geshe Doga gives the example of monks in a monastery uh, leaving as soon as they can to attempt to attend uh, tantric college, even before their uh, monastic uh, Geshe studies have been completed. They then go to a cave to meditate and after some time come back down despondent because they have not achieved anything. So we really do need to, to do our, our preparation 
And I just thought to mention here that um, in the setting up of the lum rim structure, there's great emphasis placed on the preliminary practices, such as cleaning the place of practice and setting up the altar, arranging an attractive display of offerings, correctly sitting in the meditational posture and then taking refuge and generating bodhicitta, generating the visualization of the field of merit, offering the seven limbed prayer together with uh, mandala offering and offering prayers and supplication to the teachers in the line of transmission. Uh, that's all to commence the meditation session. So you can see how incredibly uh, careful and particular we are in setting up the conditions to practice. So often Westerners in particular, um, who sort of come with secular backgrounds, have, have a, not always, but I'm just saying this is a generalisation, but it is frequently met, this view, that somehow rituals like this are a waste of time. They're getting in the road of pure practice. Therefore, I'll dispense with them. But I'm saying the opposite here, that they have a very important uh, function, which is to prepare, soften our mind, bring it down to earth, if you like, so that we can really begin to work on the conditions uh, of our daily existence in a very insightful manner, because we've created a kind of symbolic arena for that to occur. And so people often say, oh, I don't, can't set up the altar, I don't have any altar things. Well, you can go out into the garden and find some beautiful things to put there. A single Dharma book represents the Dharma. Um, a, a single photo of, of the Buddha represents the Holy Buddha, enlightenment. And in this way, if you like, we can build up an altar with very, very simple uh, ingredients and uh, place some very simple, humble offerings before it. So these are very important ways of uh, preparing for practice. So at the, again, at the end of this verse, we have the running refrain. So I'll now go to verse 58. And we're looking at the Burson translation here, which is fine. Our wish to be happy is strong at all times, yet we do not gather merit to yield this result. We have little endurance for hardship and suffering yet ruthlessly push for the things we desire. Trample him, trample him. Dance on the head of this treacherous concept of selfish concern. Tear out the heart of this self-centred butcher who slaughters our chance to gain final release. And the Venerable Jones translation. We have great desire for pleasure, yet do not accumulate the collection of its causes. We have little tolerance for suffering, yet our longing, desire and covetousness are great. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin. So again, the essence here is dealing with the disjunction between aspiration and methodology. We have a desire for happiness. It's always strongly present within us. However, this verse is saying that there's no point in having what it's referring to as strong desire or longing desire, because such a longing desire is never going to be fulfilled unless we attain the right collection of, of causes and conditions. If we don't attain the right collection of causes and conditions, it's because we're not we're being governed by the self-cherishing attitude. So in other words, great things are possible that we can aspire towards, but they don't even begin to become tangible possibilities if we're still under the sway of the self-cherishing mind. So the text says we have little tolerance for heart suffering. And so... This is due to our lack of clear motivation. Because our motivation is very weak, it's easily lost. Just the slightest disturbance in worldly terms is enough for us to become rattled 
or distracted. This shows that we haven't yet learnt about hardship and effort via a deep understanding of the law of cause and effect. We've been living as, I'm going to sort of jump in here and say, hedonistic nihilists. We are living as though the law of cause and effect doesn't exist. As a result, we have no view of anything beyond our immediate gratification. As such, we're not even yet a Buddhist practitioner on the small scope. So if we're practicing only for the attainment of happiness in this lifetime, now, 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 we're not even stepping a small toe on the path. So we need to renounce this short focus very, very uh, vigorously. Ishidoga says, we need to check the mind to see what sorts of things we desire and whether we're ready to create the causes to fulfill our desire or not. But we should not let desire rule our lives. Rather, we should think of getting rid of it and so here His Holiness makes a distinction very carefully when he's presenting the topic uh, between a, a kind of afflicted desire, which is to become more famous and, and, and more, more wealthy, with a genuine desire to become compassionate in order to stop harming others. The second one is perfectly legitimate and should be encouraged, while the first is an afflicted mind which should be overwhelmed and removed. So desire in itself isn't the problem, in other words. So I just thought to touch here on, on the importance of uh, relaxing at, at death time, um, because craving, which is a, a very strong type of desire, um, has a particular relevance in terms of the eighth link of the 12 links of interdependent origination. I'll just quickly give a, a synopsis here. The eighth link of craving develops from the seventh link of feelings of pleasure, pain, and neutrality. This craving is different from all the other forms of craving and grasping that arise just prior to the moments of death. The link of craving this is very specific nourishes the seeds left on our mental continuum by compositional factors, karmic actions, if you like, which is the second link, and it nourishes uh, the seeds left on our mental continuum, making them ripen whereby they can produce their results quickly. So here we can use the analogy of a, of a seed planted in a field. For that seed to be able to be made manifest as a sprout and develop into a plant, we need nourishing conditions such as water, fertilizer, heat, and so forth. Similarly, the karmic potential stored in our consciousness has to be nourished in order to act as a cause for the result of the next rebirth. In this eighth link craving, it is this link that nourishes this karmic uh, potential in our mind. And then the ninth link grasping um, brings it about you know, it ripens to a point where it's able to manifest its result. It's a stage where the potential of the second link of karmic composition or actions or karmic formations have been nourished sufficiently to manifest their, their complete result. So these links of craving and grasping arise when we're very close to the cessation of this lifetime and we'll only have control at this time uh, if we have the karma not to be reborn in samsara. Now, that's sort of in general terms, but the lamas are often giving very specific instructions here that we can, if we've previously meditated and have become familiar with powerful virtuous objects, we can use this experience of being very close to death as this very powerful craving and grasping arise to perform uh, tonlen meditation in conjunction with a powerful mind of bodhicitta or recite uh, Om Mani Pung mantras, visualizing the Buddha of compassion pouring 
healing energy into us and uh, all beings and so forth. And so if we can activate this kind of longing at this moment, it's said to be able to ripen positive imprints on stored on our mind stream, which will then ensure a positive rebirth. And if we're looking at this from a Bodhisattva's perspective, again, we're not looking for a positive rebirth for just me, 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 because I want to be happy. It's a form of responsibility to have a positive rebirth, because otherwise, how on earth am I going to be situated to work for the benefit of others? So there's great importance here. If we can't look after this one with skill and concern, how on earth are we going to look after the one next to us? And the one next to us on the other side we're incapable of helping even ourselves we're pitiful in other words and so again this kind of self-responsibility isn't arrogance or pride it's the ethical foundation of a bodhisattva's uh, commitment to rescue others so it becomes very profound and so in the context of uh, high sugar tantra we can also use this time same period of time just before death to take the three ordinary states of birth, death, and, and intermediate state into the path as the three kayas. So I'll move on now to will verse 58 in the Gen, Gen, uh, Venerable Joan version. To the hearts of the enemy, the self and the executioner, Maria. Our new friendships are great, yet our concern for propriety is short-lasting. Our obsessive hunger is strong, yet we steal and rob and zealously go in search of more. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin to the hearts of the enemy, the self and the executioner, Maraya. So what are our new friendships referred to in the second line? Geshe Jumper Gatso's commentary gives the, the meaning as follows. He says, there are people who, whenever a new lama comes along, without investigating or analysing, request him to give them teachings. Or else, when they meet a new person, also without taking time to investigate and to analyse him or her or them, they immediately form a relationship. However, after some time, Something happens and they begin to disparage and criticise that lama or that person. They do not even look at him and so forth. So the essential gist of this verse is that we shouldn't be too quick to form relationships with others. And similarly, just as importantly, we should not be so quick or too quick to end them. The reference here has particular poignancy in relation to the uh, bond between guru and disciple, but it can also refer very, very pertinently to our relationship to our partners and, and to family members. So his uh, Sakya Pandita gives the following uh, oral advice he says it's very rare to find someone who possesses all the positive qualities and someone who possesses none so if we're looking for the perfect person we know this from sort of dating sites don't we um, we're bound to come unstuck because we're not going to find that ideal person or that person that's going to fit our ideal image at all so part of having a healthy relationship with others is not to have all this ridiculous, projective, superimposition of qualities we expect that person to have and, and also qualities that we expect them to supply to fulfil our own needs and pleasure. It has to be something uh, more subtle than that, less uh, promiscuous, less fragile. So the meaning of excessive hunger, or excessive hunger in the third line there, there are people who have a very strong desire for clothing, wealth, and so forth. 
although in order to have such um, gains, a great deal of merit is required. Instead, what did they do? They robbed, they stole, and they zealously went in search of wealth in, in other countries where the people were unable to protect it and engaged in buying and selling goods for a profit. So a lot of, if you like, the rampant excesses of our economy are dependent on exactly this type of um, exploitation, aren't they? So I'll just mention a, a humorous story here, another, uh, yeah, it's a delightful story. Um, Geshe Sopa gives the example of in Tibet, in the villages, uh, when a traveling entertainer arrived, they would announce their entrance to the town uh, with the sound of drums. And as soon as the townspeople heard the sounds of drumming, they would rush over to the new arrivals without even knowing what was going on. So a bit like the Pied Piper, isn't it? <laughs> the, the drummer had sort of proceeded to walk over a cliff. It's one would suspect half the villagers would have followed them over the edge. And so this is really a metaphor for the way in which you know, extreme avarice is functioning. It, it doesn't discriminate or see its object very clearly at all. So similarly, we run around attracted by wealth, comfort, good food and clothing, fine clothing. And if we can't achieve these things legitimately, we'll try and obtain them by some underhand means. So rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin to the hearts of the enemy, the self and the executioner, Mariah. Verse 59, then will Joan translation. We are skilled in flattery and solicitation, yet our net greedy disposition is strong. Although we zealously amass and accumulate, we are bound by miserliness. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin, to the hearts of the enemy, the self, and the executioner, Maria. So again, I think that this communicates very clearly, but in particular it points to the crooked and even devious extents to which we'll go to acquire what we so zealously seek to accumulate. And so we'll cajole, insinuate, flatter, bribe, etc. Solicitation here has a very particular pertinence when we consider those living in vows. If someone in living within the vows, Pratamoksha vows, says, oh, they look like good sandals, especially for wearing in hot weather, and the person who hears this thereby feels obligated to offer them or similar ones to that ordained person, this constitutes hinting and breaks an ordination vow. Another per example given by Geshe Naandagi is, what you gave me last year was very useful. This again, has a function as a hint that that person therefore might give similarly again this year. So you can see here that uh, when it says experts, we, we do develop a certain finesse, a uh, dreadful finesse in, in getting our own way by manipulating through um, solicitation and flattery. So we need to look at our own examples, but it's also, uh, although we zealously amass and accumulate, we are bound by miserliness. We're dealing here with the actual internal poverty of the hoarder. So we have an image like a Naga king sitting on a great hoard of jewels, but unable to uh, give up even a single one for a mouthful of food. So zealous that they are to hold on to the accumulation. And so, this tightness, if you like, based on, on greed and, and acquisition is actually a, a form of intense pain already in itself because it's unable to engage with the world. So we need to contrast this kind of hoarding mentality, this 
zealously amassing mentality with uh, the meaning of, of gen genuine generosity, which from a dharmic perspective expects nothing in return. So Shanti Davis says, oh, we must develop this open-handed generosity in stages, however. Shanti Davis says at the beginning, the guide of the world, meaning Shakyamuni Buddha, encourages the giving of such things as food. Later, when accustomed to this, one may progressively start to give away even one's flesh. So we have the famous story here, don't we, of the, of the Buddha as a Bodhisattva giving away his body to feed the hungry lioness so she could nourish her, her cubs. So such acts of donating one's body seem quite shocking um, from our immediate perspective. But it's said that if one can really generate genuine uh, bodhicitta, and particularly when one has the ability to realise emptiness non-conceptually, it's possible to do these extraordinary acts in a, in a wise and skillful manner. So we don't attempt to do them too early. But it's good to think about them as uh, acts, the epitome of generosity, really. So an, an example is Islam is Oprah Rinpoche, Kabzo is Oprah Rinpoche, um, deliberately refusing uh, to be covered by, by his attendant assistant, Roger, when he's in a mosquito-filled room in, in Delhi. And it's because Rinpoche uh, will immediately do a puja as of his blood as an offering to all the mosquitoes. So he'll offer his body to the mosquitoes in the room rather than get out the mortine. So it's again, complete opposite. So it's said that um, the reason well, an image of why we need to develop giving in stages is, is beautifully captured in the beautiful image of uh, someone, a woman who's very mean. And Shakyamuni Buddha said, oh, for you, dear, give to one hand with the other. Meaning, I've got this. I can't give it to you yet because I'm still too attached, but I'll give it to my other hand and let it go. That itself is training in generosity in, in a very, very interesting way. So it sort of uh, creates the seeds of generosity, if you like. So I'll move now to verse uh, 60. Uh, Venerable Joan translation now. We do little for everyone, yet we bemoan the hardships. We lack a sense of responsibility, yet our megalomania is great. Rant and rave on the head of this conception that brings about our ruin to the hearts of the enemy, the self, and the executioner, RAR. So there is something grotesque, isn't there, in the bloated stance whereby we actively avoid or minimise doing anything to assist others. Yet, meanwhile, bemoan the hardships we must undergo to do even that little much. So Geshe Doga uh, points out that if we don't show gratitude, if others don't show gratitude for the little help we've given them, we can be easily disappointed. Further, if the person who we've helped does something wrong, we can become mad at them. We can decide even never to help them again and think how ungrateful and appreciative they are of our help and so on. So this kind of thinking, miserable thinking, is really a variation of the miser sitting on an immense fortune and crying poor. If we genuinely care for others, we don't even begin to think in such self-regarding and self-seeking terms. So I'll go to verse 61, uh, Venerable Joan. Our acharyas are many, yet our pledges, obligations, and friends are few. Our students are many, yet we benefit and protect them inadequately. And then the, the refrain. And Burzen says, we have many great masters and teachers to guide us, 
Yet shirking our duty, we ignore what they teach. We have many disciples, yet they do, we do not ever help them. We cannot be bothered to even give them advice. And again, the refrain. So we have heard pure Dharma from many highly qualified teachers, yet nonetheless, we shirk our duty, referring to our precepts and our obligations, and we ignore what they teach, even as we fail to adequately provide for our many disciples. So Gishin Awandagi describes this situation as deplorable. He says, both teacher and teachings must strike our shortcomings unerringly. If they are complacent towards them, they show the lack of compassion of one who allows a blind man to walk towards a precipice. In the light of this, to shirk or shun what the teacher or the teachings have to offer us is to consign ourselves to walking with eyes locked shut over the edge, which is the abyss to the lower realms, as Pabonka Rinpoche would, would point out at the beginning of our liberation of the power of your hands. So we'll move to verse 63, the Urzen translation, which is the Dagi one. We promise, thank you, to do many glorious deeds. In practice, we give others minimal help. Our spiritual fame has been spread far and wide, yet inwardly all our thoughts are repulsive, not only to gods, but to demons and ghosts, and then the refrain. And General Jones' version, our commitments are great, yet our beneficial practice is small. Our reputation is great, yet when examined would embarrass the deities and spirits, and then the refrain. So again, there's a vast chasm indicated between our Dharma promises and our actual engagement in helping others, and a chasm between our outer fame as a spiritual yogi or teacher and our inner paucity of qualities and practice. So this is referring to one who pretends to be not only on the path, but well advanced along it. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Put to the test, will be found to be sadly lacking and thus be exposed as a sham, a pretense. And such capacity to be exposed as a sham or a pretense testifies to the failure of having kept our spiritual promises and commitments. Although we have committed ourselves to training enlightenment for all beings, in fact, even our moral discipline is full of holes. Our actions are poor, so poor that they shock even the evil spirits. What need to mention the transcendental deities? So regarding this verse, Geshe Nandagi says, if this teaching doesn't transform our minds, what will? Yet we keep them in the teachings on a shelf and away from our minds. How can any effect take place? So Geshe Doga says we should only undertake more vows and commitments if we're prepared to devote more of our time towards practice. And this is essential practice indeed. I think particularly in our uh, digital age, where it would seem that we have access to many, many teachers and many, many teachings, and we can even participate in online initiations. So we need to step back and take stock. Are we act actually practicing what we've promised? If we find we keep acquiring new teachers and new practices, we must uh, deeply consider whether or not we're fooling ourselves or not just ourselves, but those who rely on us, especially more so if we've somehow assumed the, the plumage of spiritual accomplishment. So someone like I'm, you know, in a way here, assuming the plumage of spiritual accomplishment because I'm pretending to teach you <laughs> based on inner realizations. And so it's, it's kind of tricky 
uh, when you put yourself into this role, because uh, you can be seen to have qualities that are far in excess of what you actually do have. And so one has to then all the time turn the torch back on inside and have a look, what is going on inside Ross? What's going on inside me? And so we all have an equivalent of this. Sometimes a friend comes and says, oh, what's, why do you do put your hands together like that when we go for refuge? Or why do you do the mandala symbolic mudra with the, the hands? And you give some highfalutin answer made up of just sort of gobbledygook that you've mustered out of nowhere on the spot because you don't want to show your friend that you don't know something. And so that's an incredible example of this kind of uh, fault. So we're, we're cheating the teachings in that way. So we have to trample those uh, examples of self-cherishing mind. So we'll move now to Will verse uh, 64. And it really continues this line of thought. Burzen says, um, we have read very little, heard only a few teachings, yet talk with authority expertly on voidness. Our knowledge of scriptures is pitifully lacking, yet glibly we make up and say what we like, and then the refrain. And the Venerable Jones says, the extent of our hearing is small, yet our boastful empty talk is great. The extent of our scriptural knowledge is small, yet we have realised all that is not yet realised. So this really, again, extends to an examination of whether or not we're a sham practitioner. The line in the Venerable Jones translation, quote, yet we have realised all that is not yet realised, end of quote, means that our pretense of realisation is as vast as are the realisations themselves. And in the Burzen translation, he says, yet glibly we make up and say what we like, end of quote, amounts to the same fraudulent thing, because though we have no realisations, we speak and act with the authority of being endowed precisely those realisations that we in fact lack. We know at least the word bodhicitta or great compassion or emptiness, for example, and therefore can see a certain self-serving advantage in throwing them into our speech so that others will be impressed and inclined to assume that we're endowed with all kinds of realisations. So I guess you don't indicate the situation becomes even more, um, means uh, that such pompous beings, even when they're sincerely asked a Dharma question, will avoid giving an answer because in reality they don't know it, or they might improvise by mentioning a few buzzwords to give the illusion that they know more than they're letting out. So do we fit this bill? So do we fudge our Dharma knowledge, in other words? So again, this has to be trampled underfoot, this kind of attitude of, of uh, exhibiting distorted knowledge if we have it or refusing to give it and pretending we're vastly endowed with inner knowledge at the same time. We have to abandon these sort of tactics altogether. So verse 64, Venerable Jones says, our servants are many, yet none of them takes any responsibility. Our masters are many, yet they are without a supporter and protector. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin to the hearts of the enemy, the self, the executioner, Maria. So this verse refers to a situation where we, we are a famous teacher, Lama, and as such would naturally attract many people to us. But if you are packed, if you packed the knowledge and skill to maintain good relationships, um, it's okay here. Yeah. Yeah. The gist of this really is that um, we're required to cultivate loving kindness and caring thoughts for others. And even if it's just one person, we try to benefit them in whatever way possible.
So I, th- I thought to myself when I was reading this verse, I was trying to relate it actually. So I don't, I don't have servants as I can see in, in my life at the moment. Um, and I don't sort of have masters as, as such either. So it's sort of, we have to work out how to make this uh, verse relevant. It clearly um, was written at a time when the caste system and, and feudal cultures were very much uh, prevalent social norms. But I still think that it's very relevant uh, in our world today because we have a, have a situation where despotic uh, authoritarian dictators are waging dreadful war, slaughtering thousands in the name of some uh, chivalric nationalism or historical empire. And so the language caught up in this verse is still very, very present, I think, in our world. So we'll move now to verse 65, Venerable Jones' translation. We have great status, yet our qualities are less than a spirit's. We are great lamas, yet our attachment and hatred are rougher than Mara's. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin. To the hearts of the enemy, the self and the executioner, Maria. So again, the target is those who you would expect to know better. When the text declares with mock praise, we have great status, or in the Burzen translation, we are great lamas, the bloated extent of our actual paucity of spiritual accomplishments is thereby declared and measured. So if we are filled with attachment and hatred greater than Mara's, then it is clear we are not qualified to be great in virtue in any way whatsoever. If great, it's great in the afflictions which we have so extensively developed. So this is really referring to a situation where we we, uh, claim to have credentials, but in fact have no knowledge. Our knowledge is actually less than that of a ghost following the imagery in the, in the verse, in the spirits, less than the spirits. Having credentials but no worth is worth nothing. What puts us in this situation is once again the self-cherishing attitude, trample it. I'll move now to verse 66. Our view is lofty, yet our behaviour is worse than a dog's. The basis of all our good qualities has been lost in the wind. Rant and rave on the head of the conception that brings about our ruin, to the hearts of the enemy, the self, the executioner, Maria. So we claim very high views that there's no inherent existence and so forth. And we boast about having uh, entered the highly esoteric Vajrayana, but our actual behaviour belittles the law of cause and effect of morality. And so there's also a reference here that often... Uh, yogis, so-called, feel that they can dispense with ordinary morality altogether because they have such a high view, such a lofty view, that they transcend ordinary social mores and they can drink and uh, sleep around and, and so using toxicants and so forth. And a lot of these problems were prevalent in, in Tibet uh, at the time that Atisha arrived and, and he took uh, made great efforts to try to return um, meditators to the foundation of a, of a genuine ethical basis so that they wouldn't get carried away in these extreme ways. So uh, this has a particular note of caution for us who are engaged in tantric practice and um, I just want to mention here uh, a sort of, yeah, I might finish there, actually. I, was, I just had one, one more point to do with that verse, which um, to do with the practice of ethics, which I think is worth bearing about, thinking about. If our guru, and particularly our tantric guru, instructs us to do something that appears to go against uh, ethical mores, 
such as kill that person, they're irritating me or whatever. I want you as my disciple to, to eliminate them. Do you follow their instruction or not? So this sort of raises the whole uh, issue of what it means to have guru devotion. And there's a story that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, quotes in relation to this issue. And he says, uh, it tells of Shakyamuni Buddha's in Shakyamuni's previous life as a bodhisattva disciple of a teacher. Uh, while the other the student, the, the teacher told the students to go out and steal. And while the other students nodded in agreement and went off to steal, one particular student remained behind. Asked to explain his silence and his lack of enthusiasm, the student said that stealing was unethical and contradicted the general conduct explained in the teachings. The teacher who'd been testing the students then praised him. So in that moment, that student who didn't follow the guru's instruction was the only real student because it was the only student who understood what ethical protect, um, practice meant. So the Venerable Tukton Chodron uh, mentions in her commentary on this verse, and I'm, I'm referring here to uh, Good Karma here. I don't know if this book's still in print. Actually, had, it is. I had to buy a copy on um, line secondhand. So it's, I think, uh, Shambhala. Anyway, I'm not sure that it's still in print, but it's worth finding if you can because it's got a very uh, fine commentary on, on the text in it. And uh, Venerable Tutan Shurdran says, Lama Atisha, one of the Indian scholar practitioners who brought Buddhism to Tibet in the 11th century, is an ex excellent example of this. Whenever he had the smallest infraction of a tantric precept, which the rest of us would break like rainfall, he would immediately confess it. Apparently while walking, while traveling, if he had a negative thought, he would immediately stop, take out a stupa, out of his luggage, repent and do prostrations to the stupa to purify. And she tells a, a wonderful story of Lama Zoprumpshe, who seldom takes breaks while doing meditational retreat. On this occasion, uh, his attendant saw uh, Lama Zoprumpshe out walking. Surprised, he asked Rinpoche what had happened. And Rinpoche responded, this is just a short break. I have had a negative thought. So I'm going to start the retreat all over. <laughs> so this is a kind of particular is particularity, if you like, the absolute finesse of the precision involved in maintaining one's morality. So in relation to, to yogis who claim to have transcended uh, ordinary morality and therefore can get away with murder, um, His Holiness, when asked uh, a question on, on this topic in, in a public gathering in India where there were many Westerners present, said that not only must a yogi to be qualified as a genuine yogi have the capacity to make a piece of fruit drop from its branch of a tree overhead, but the yogi must have the capacity to return the piece of fruit to the branch. And then he remains silent. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> because there, there were stories going around of particular lamas at the time who were claiming to have miraculous, or not claiming, uh, saying they have miraculous powers. So what his holiness is saying here, that if you do have miraculous powers, and miraculous yogic powers are possible, so the question isn't here that they're not possible, but that if we're to profess to have them, to have fulfil this verse, if you like, we um, have to be absolutely sure that we can justify that with real evidence which we won't have. So we'll finish there at the end of uh, that verse and I'll, I'll move on next week. And we are get, getting through. At some, I don't really enjoy this pace so much. That's why I stumble occasionally. There's one verse that I, I thought I didn't do justice to because I'm trying to jump a bit and uh, I don't mean that to happen. But I'm thinking we're, we're really now immersed in the text and we're very familiar with the language. 
And it's sort of hammering, isn't it, away at us. <laughs> we go to look over here, it's whack. We look over here, it's another whack. And uh, it's this sort of almost merciless um, attack on the self-cherishing that is so noteworthy in this text. It doesn't pull any punches. And so now in these verses we're looking at today, it's really dealing with, with practitioners on the path, ones who should know better, who have still got pride and the afflictions operating and therefore have to work on their practice. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll finish there. And have you got uh, any points, Stephen, you'd like to bring up for the group or? Stephen's been saying that the, the discussions are being vigorous and, and enjoyable and he feels productive. So I really thank you for, for putting that energy in. And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing the text with you. We've only got a, a few weeks to go, so we'll zoom along. And if you do have any comments and uh, you'd like feedback to give me feedback, then uh, Stephen will happily transmit that to me. Thank you. So we'll finish with the prayers. Thank you. Dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Long life prayers for His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. To the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Lama Zopa Rinpoche. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjunas' victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And Tenzin Oselhita, venerable one, to you whose kindness exceeds that of all the conquerors, for those wanderers in far off places, especially the West, mindful of your loving concern for us, in intentionally descending again into a family of a far distant land, we make this request, O Lama, please, please live long. So thank you. Thank you. Great discussion, and I'll, I'll see you next week.